second uh, Peter chapter three, verse nine. It says, the Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about this verse um, today. It reminded me of um, a truth God showed me about three, three and a half years ago. Um, I was at a different church in Kentucky, and I was asked to leave the church after attending for a couple of, um, about a year and a half. Um, it was a difficult time for me because there's just a lot of doubt. Um, in my heart regarding the situation. Um, and before I left, they had accused me of um, several sinful attitudes. And so it was difficult, but also looking at the church, I could see what felt like good fruits coming out of them. And it was hard for me to reconcile those two truths. It was, I felt that it was either that what they said was right. And so I needed to repent. Um, if not, it means that what I was seeing was, was not the work of God, even in their midst. And although I prayed about it for a couple of months, I did not feel like the Holy Spirit was convicting me of anything. Um, but in that period, God showed me a passage in Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21, verse 20. Um, so this passage is during a time when Paul had just finished his third missionary journey and he returned to Jerusalem and he met with the elders in Jerusalem and he, um, well, he had shared all the glorious things that God had done um, during his um, ministry to the Gentiles. And so in verse 20, it says, and when they heard it, that is the elders in Jerusalem, they began glorifying God. And they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands are there are among the Jews of those who have believed. And they are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are, are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses telling them not to circumcise their children, not to walk according to the customs, to the customs. And um, this is just what I believe. But what God showed me through this was that, yes, the thousands of, of people, of Jews who believed in Jesus, the, their faith was genuine, right? There were a lot of them, but they still did not have light on the message Paul preached, which was that there was no distinction between Gentiles and Jews. And as a result of that, I saw that I don't think Paul would ever have been able to have the ministry he had in Jerusalem, um, just because they would have kicked him out. Um, so that was insightful for me to see just the large heartedness of God, where you have these two groups of people who disagree with each other um, in doctrine and one group may even persecute the other group, but God is so patient. God has this great desire that no one should perish, even those who don't have the right doctrine or those who don't have light on certain areas. And um, it's in the midst of that pain, it was a glimpse into the heart of God. And that has helped me in just so many areas when I hear so much about what's going on um, in Christendom, in other churches, um, and even why God allows a lot of things to happen. Or there are some things that it seems like it's a dishonor to God's name, but it seems like God is not, um, God is patient, God is not, um, God is allowing those things to happen. Um, and I saw that God is even willing to allow his name to be dishonored amongst Christians, just so that some people would be saved. And um, 
And some other examples I see of this is in Matthew 7, verse 21, where it talks about many people coming to God saying, Lord, we have done so many wonderful things in your name and we've cast out demons. And yeah, they say that to Jesus and Jesus says, I never knew you. Those, I always used to wonder why would God allow people who he never knew to be able to perform miracles to be able to do so many wonderful things in his name and i believe it's the same reason that god is like yeah even though the motive of these people is not genuine yet i am willing to use them to save other people and there's another example in philippians 1 verse 15 to 18 where Paul talks about a group of people who were preaching Christ, not out of a genuine desire for people to be saved, but out of envy and a hatred for Paul. And Paul says, I rejoice. I'm glad that Christ is preached regardless. And I believe why Paul could have that attitude was because he was like, I know God can use even this, um, the actions of these people, even though the motive is not genuine, he can use it. Um, to bring people to Christ. And um, practically speaking, that just, again, like I said, helped me in so many areas. Um, I think the first thing is that it's helped me not to judge other people because I'm like, I don't know what God is doing. Um, I mean, they may not, I mean, I agree with people in doctrine. And this is sometimes, this is like friends or family members. So it's not like, it's people who I'm related to and I interact with. And God has helped me not to judge them because I'm like, I don't know what God is doing in their midst. And um, also coming to myself, it's helped me also to not judge myself or my stand with God based on what God is doing through me. So if God may be using me to bless people, um, let's say on Tuesday, I share and say blessing to people. I want to have the attitude that it just means God wanted to bless people. It doesn't say anything about whether there's a sin I need to repent of, of or not. Or if um, my home is, I have a um, great marriage and my home is um, peaceful, it may not mean that I am, the I am being the husband I should be. It may just mean that God does not want my wife to be discouraged or God is answering the, wife, the prayers of my wife. And so that's, that's something I, I have come to see that God is willing to use anybody um, just to save a few. And um, finally, another temptation I can see is that having be, seen how merciful God is, I can have the attitude of, oh, I'm going to become slack in my work with Christ. My God is a merciful God. God is patient. Um, I can... Point to other people, I'm like, these Christians, they seem to have a good life and they are okay with doing this particular thing. And maybe it's okay for me to do it, even if God is convicting me. And um, I, I was blessed to, again, seeing the memory verse, it specifically says that, um, that God does not wish for anybody to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And so that's the purpose of God's patience, not that we take it for granted, but that we are quick to repent of any sin that um, the Holy Spirit shows to us. And also later on in the same chapter, in um, 2 Peter 3, 15, it says um, we should regard the patience of the Lord as salvation. And so for me, I saw those two things that I should when the Lord is patient with me, the two things I need to make sure I'm doing is one, repenting of any sin the Holy Spirit shows me about, and to have that desire to be saved from every form of unchrist likeness. And I pray that that would also be our attitude, that the patience of God towards us all would bring forth fruits of continual repentance and salvation from every form of unchrist likeness. In Jesus' name. Okay. Hi, family. Good afternoon. Um, it's great to be with you all this afternoon. I would like to share a couple of thoughts that have been on my mind. Um, this is uh, on the topic, uh, being a disciple and making a disciple. 
Um, and this comes from Matthew 28. Uh, the first half of the Great Commission where God, Jesus, you know, gave to his disciples, you know, go into the, all the world and make disciples, teaching them all that he taught. Uh, in this relation, the first half of being a disciple really come, you know, encouraged me as a dad. We heard a lot about being a dad in, in last several weeks from Abraham's life, from Brother Vedhai last week. And one thing that really encouraged me from on this topic of being a dad um, you know, as dads, we are called to instruct and discipline our children, right? Ephesians chapter six, verse four. Um, and I was convicted about that lately. And I was challenged to think, what am I doing in that regard at home? Am I actively doing anything to invest in my children to make them disciples? Um, and what I was really encouraged was from Job chapter one. You know, um, in, in this book, what I, what I, in the chapter one, what I see is Job was a very accomplished man probably very busy as well, right? He was a very rich man, a lot to manage. He had thousands of animals, different types of animals. He had seven sons and three daughters. And what really blessed me is that he was not concerned about the whether his sons will manage his inheritance well, whether, you know, whether, you know, what will happen to his inheritance and, and you know, all that stuff, or, you know, how, how good his sons will be with respect to all the business and all that. But what he was really concerned, as we know this, is um, from Job chapter 1, verse 5, he's really wanting his sons to be pure, to be wholehearted disciples. Um, and, and that's really what he's praying. He's saying, Lord, maybe my sons have sinned in their hearts. I want to pray for them. I want to continually. And so he, he sent them, sent for them early in the morning, and he would pray with them. And, and he, would, he would really guide them and, you know, to, to be you know, have a clear conscience with God. So as a dad, I was really challenged on that. And uh, uh, practically as a small attempt in my, you know, in, in my journey, I was able to start something with my kids to share, you know, talk about parables and different things like that at home. Um, and I'm trusting that the Lord will bless that for them. And the second part of this one was, you know, to, to be a disciple and, you know, make disciples outward, others that I come across in, in life, and um, and uh, one of the life that really encouraged me is, is Daniel and the influence he had uh, around, you know, with, with different people in his life. Daniel starts with, you know, Daniel 1, where he was dragged to some other place and he was made a eunuch. He was away from his own land, uh, and, but he made up his mind to not defile himself. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. And he said, I, I'm going to walk blamelessly before God. Like, you know, maybe he may, he may have read, you know, Genesis 17, where God told Abraham to walk before him blamelessly. And he said, I'm going to be blameless uh, before God in every area of my life. And now it's about the food. And he, he took that seriously. And very soon, you know, in chapter two, you see these three men coming into his life, praying with him. And, and learning from him and encouraging him, encouraging each other. And Daniel interprets the dream to Nebuchadnezzar in chapter two. And in chapter three, we see that those three men that Daniel encouraged are now become disciples. They, they, were, ready, they, they were thrown into the fire by the king, and, but they came out blameless. So I was really encouraged that Daniel, who lived pure before God, God used his life to make disciples. And he brought the other people to him, and then as and 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 it worked out pretty well. And not only that, but Daniel's influence. I was really blessed that it it went to Nebuchadnezzar, and went to Cyrus, went to Darius the kings, and went probably to Nehemiah, Ezra, way past his generation. And I was really blessed that if if I am walking with the Lord, taking you know everything what He commanded me seriously, taking the cost of the discipleship that we heard from Luke chapter 14, seriously, all that Jesus said in, 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 the, in the Gospels, what we heard, uh, seriously, then God is going to allow this, uh, allow others to that come across our life to become disciples, and God does that. Um, and there is a verse in Luke chapter 11 that, that blessed me recently, and this is Luke chapter 1, 11, verse 36. And there is a phrase here, it's, it talks about conscience, and this phrase is, when there is no dark part in our conscience, it will be wholly illumined. Um, when there is no dark part in my life, then God's light fully shines through my life 
wherever I go, whether it be at home where, where my children and my wife are watching me, where I'll be able to invest in them to make wholehearted disciples. And when I'm at work or interacting with others that I come, I come across, they will be disciples as well. And then, so, you know, John 1, John 1, 7, if I walk in the light as he's in the light, um, then God will allow that fellowship to happen and discipleship happens. So I really trust that the Lord will, you know, help me to um, take this seriously to be a disciple and to take seriously to make disciples at home and, and outside as, as God allows and leads me. Thank you.